Okay, wonderful. So what I will do is, is share a bit about regenerative business and leadership, and I'll do that. Uh, I've been given 20 minutes, so I will do that by offering the regenerative business and leadership DNA that I have created and developed with um, my uh, colleague, Giles Hutchins, and he and I also co-wrote and co-authored the book, Regenerative Leadership. So that is what I will focus uh, the next 20 minutes on taking you all through. So you have probably seen versions of this visualization um, in, in, in slightly different shapes and forms maybe, but this is the, the process that we are that we are in the midst of and hopefully we are collectively helping to hold space for the regenerative era to emerge so we need to move away from exploiting natural and human resources and and need to start to align with the principles of life and learn from living systems and learn from the only system that has stood the test of time. So that is what regenerative business is all about, aligning with nature and, and aligning with life's approach to organizing and collaborating. Um, and what that is all about, I will um, briefly take you to take you through. So many organizations and businesses and business leaders that are in in the in the beginning phases of this journey are a bit confused where to start and what does regenerative business mean and to what extent is it different from sustainability and that is the reason that we created the dna framework the dna framework gives you an overview of what we believe are the key dna strands of a regenerative business um, and it helps you get um, not only an, an overview of, of what regenerative business and leadership means, but also where you could potentially start your journey. Um, so I will talk you through these three main components of the, of the regenerative business and leadership DNA. It consists of living systems design, how do we produce our products and services? Living systems culture, how do we create thriving, uh, abundant cultures within our organizations, within our communities, within our societies? And then the third component that is last but really not least is all about living system being qualities. What capacities do we need? to nurture within to be able to hold space for the emergence of this um, of this new paradigm so everything um, in in the regenerative era is based on what we call the logic of life John works with the eight principles of a, of a regenerative economy Biomimicry Institute works with life's design principles but it's more or less the same same it's the essence of how life works we have these seven principles that is um, the essence of how life continuously create conditions for more life to thrive. And that is the foundation of the regenerative business and leadership DNA framework. Um, and then there are 17 DNA strands, and we don't have time for me to talk you through all, all 17 of those, but I'll just give you a little taste of each of the three main components. As you could probably see, there are two pulsating dynamics weaving through the, the, the framework, life dynamics and leadership dynamics. Leadership dynamics is this oscillating energy between self-awareness, really strong awareness around who we are in the world, but also systemic awareness, understanding systems thinking, understanding and ecosystem systemic design thinking, etc. And and when we are able to bring these pulsating dynamics together, that is where we are tapping into regenerative leadership consciousness. Maybe we can talk more about that in the discussion. But it's all about understanding that continuously the inner informs the outer. Our quality of our inner being informs the potential change that we are able to initiate in the outer world. Um, and it's important for change makers especially to keep in mind that change has to start within because whatever we have in here are creating ripple effects and those ripples can either be degenerative or regenerative and it, it's all informed by how we feel inside. Then there's life dynamics, this oscillating energy again between convergence and divergence, where diver divergence is, uh, is that energy where we are 
opening up, diversifying, getting input, um, maybe throwing a hackathon or a work talk, workshop, getting a lot of different opinions on the table. Um, but it, it will become too chaotic if we don't also, as leaders, have the energy of convergence, where we are consolidating and grounding and bringing to, together and finding the essence. And in that essence, and in that oscillating dance between the two polarities, we will have emergence. We will have the emergence of new ideas, of new life, new technologies, <laughs> new innovations. Um, and really, it's all about regenerative leaders holding space for opposites and being these alchemists of transformation, being these alchemists of polarities. Um, so those are two of the very key dynamics that are pulsating through all three components. So let's dive into living systems design. Um, for regenerative leaders, it's, in, it's incredibly important that they understand that waste doesn't exist in nature. And therefore, they have the capacity to tap into existing frameworks from the circular economy, cradle to cradle frameworks, etc. That's part of a regenerative leader's toolbox, if you can put it like that. So, so that is part of the regenerative field and part of how regenerative businesses are operating. They're, they are tapping into the potential of the circular economy. They're tapping into the potential of biomimicry, that life is the fascinating library of solutions and innovations, and that we can draw on that library when we are redesigning products and services. This is just an image of a few examples of, um, of of nature that has inspired inventions. We don't have time for me to talk you through them, but there's chocolate technologies, um, and there's also termites that have inspired um, architects to design self-cooling cooling buildings in sub-Saharan countries. Um, and then we have biophilic design, that understanding that we are all nature. Our natural habitat is, is nature, and therefore we need to bring in nature into our daily lives, into our organizations. We know from science that just after spending 20 minutes in nature, our cortisol levels, stress levels, they decrease. We become happier, we become more willing to collaborate. Our memory improves, our creative problem-solving skills improve by 50%. There are so many amazing benefits of for us to be in nature and and we need to draw that into our work lives as well we need to spend more time in nature but we also need to design biophilic design inspired buildings that are letting nature in i'll give you an, an example in a second Interfaces working on with biomimicry experts. Um, many of you have probably already heard about the factory as a forest concept, but they also work as ecosystemic design thinkers, and they are they are seeing themselves, in my opinion, as what I call ecosystem nurturers. So, in in for example, they pull Philippine fishermen to fish up discarded plastic nets from the ocean, and that is part of their value chain, um, and and that is how regenerative businesses think. So they are mapping everything in their ecosystem and they are detecting where can we um, not just sustain status quo, but where can we actually help revitalize local bioregions where we have, for example, production facilities, where can we help address the, the urgent challenges in our world right now and, and, and be a regenerative force for good in how we have designed our, um, our, our business model. Vincent Calibo is an amazing French architect who, uh, who really understands not only biomimicry, biomimicry and circular economy, but also that important component of biophilic design elements. So everything that he does is factoring in, in nature because it's good for us, but also he, he makes sure that all of his design has biodiversity and, and, and the fact that we need to create a um, nourished condition for uh, pollinators and insects and birds and um, to thrive in our in our cities he also plays a, a big importance or, or put a lot of focus on the importance of creating quiet spaces in his design so so really a remarkable architect that I would that I would remind or recommend that you dive deeper into but that was living systems design what I would like to spend a bit more time on is living systems culture which are the those DNA strands that we need to tab into if we want to help our organization.
actions move in this direction from being inspired by the machine that you can turn off and you can pull levers and you can control and optimize and exploit uh, into a fascinating tapestry of life into a living system of interconnected elements of full diversity that is based on self-organizing principles um, and there's a lot to be said about self-organization that we don't have time for today, but it's important to understand that our organizations could be tapping into living systems design principles in how they function. So just like any living system is constantly sensing and responding to, in order to ensure a dynamic equilibrium and in, in order to create the conditions for homeostasis, so can our organizations be in tune with a constantly changing environment by allowing all cells in the organism the capacity to locally sense and respond to change. Instead of a very kind of rigid, dominating, control-obsessed hierarchy where each of the cells, the employees in the, in the organism, are scared of messing up and scared of failing, so they become more kind of st stagnant cells, we need, to, we need to unleash that stagnant energy in our organization by allowing a, a, a higher degree of self-organizing capacity. Fritjof Kebra has said it quite brilliantly that we need to start seeing our organizations as these vibrant living systems where the most important thing for that living system to thrive is the degree to which the interconnected relationship is, 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 is thriving. That the degree of the relationships that are thriving really determines the overall health and vitality of that living system. So how can we start to cultivate our awareness around that? How can we start to train our ability to think in whole interconnected systems um, where we are not assessing a solution with the with the old mindset that that has gotten us in this place in the first place but that we start to train our systems thinking capacity where we assess every situation as a whole as an interconnected part of a greater tapestry of life that is influenced in in many different directions so instead of just viewing um, an organization that consists of different parts that are often working in silos and only sometimes forced to collaborate, but most often they see each other as competitors, competing for budgets, competing for, often you see KPIs that are directly competing against each other, which is, which is causing so much unnecessary friction in our organizations. Um, because imagine if the KPIs of the heart constantly undermine those of the lungs, you would have so much unnecessary energy being used at, um, at toxic energy instead of being released to actually uh, collaborate towards a shared goal. It's that understanding that, um, that in any ecosystem, it's a greater web of life. And just as in, in the webs of life in nature, in, in our organizations, there are many complex dynamic relationships. And how can we start to foster a curiosity around who are the keystone species in our system? That's that, that those species that we need to nurture because they play a pivotal role for the overall health and, and vitality of that living system. And, and often that can be a keystone species that is um, the odd one out or the annoying employee that is constantly disrupting status quo that is being rejected because it feels annoying and it feels uncomfortable, but we need to let in um, a high degree of, of, of us allowing to be uncomfortable. It's often in the darkness that we can find the golden nuggets of wisdom, and that is the capacity that we need to train ourselves as regenerative leaders. Um, so just as in any living system in nature, an organization too is a whole system that consists of dynamic feedback loops. And as regenerative leaders, we need to start train our, our eyes and our senses to detect the quality of these dynamic feedback loops. Just as the amazing Danella Meadows said, large organizations lose their resilience simply because the feedback mechanisms by which they constantly sense and respond to their environment 
have to travel through too many layers of delay and distortion. You've probably all experienced that, that toxic communication or that sense that when you walk into the system, you feel you need to wear a mask to fit, to fit in and to be accepted. Um, it can be very unhealthy power dynamics that is slowing down um, the, the health and the capacity for that living system to actually be in coherence and do what it's, it's here to do. So for regenerative leaders, we need to train the capacity to hold space for, for emergence, being alchemist of opposites and being alchemist of transformation by allowing a great degree of deep listening, a great degree of a focus on nourishing healthy relationships, not just within the organization, but also beyond, because we are part of a greater interconnected whole. Um, and, and that was clear to a lot of organizations, especially in the past couple of years. So one organization that I, that I often mention as a wonderful example of living systems culture is, a, is the Dutch healthcare provider Brutzog that was started back in 2005 by three nurses um, that was fed up by the current rigid mechanistic approach to offering elderly care. They wanted something where the heart and, and compassion was allowed the driver's seat. So they wanted to create an entity where all the nurses was allowed as much time as they wanted with the individual clients, where they could decide how much vacation they wanted and where they had a high degree of freedom. So right now, um, Bootsock has grown into a company of, of uh, a little over 15,000 employees. Um, they have just been awarded for the fifth year in a row, the most um, uh, popular company to work for. And in the Netherlands, they're being studied all over the world. Um, and what is remarkable is not only their ability to, for example, they have lowered cost according to benchmark with 40%. They have improved profitability um, according to benchmark as well with 60%. They're outperforming competitors um, in the market year on year. But it's their capacity to sense and respond, the capacity to not work with five year strategy plans, not work with KBIs. But, um, but the founder, Joost de Block, um, he says that my key role as, as a CEO is to listen. So I spend a lot of time listening to employees. That is, that is why I'm here. So I listen to their critique, their feedback, their exciting new ideas. And that has enabled Talk to now be present in 15 different markets and sectors. Um, and they're continuously growing. And he says that I have this playful attitude to trying out new things. Sometimes it fails, sometimes it's a success. But let's have fun trying. And that attitude, that joyful attitude to work and, and, and him tapping into the potent light force energy is what we need more of in our workplaces. I could talk a lot more about Buzo, but we don't have time today, but it's a case worth studying. We also mention them in, in the book, um, and I recently interviewed him, and there's a little snippet of, the, of that you can find on Regenerator's YouTube channel. So regenerators that, or regenerative leaders, they work as these acupuncturists, constantly set, sensing in to where is the stagnated energy? Where can I unleash new potential? Um, and, and I often mention the amazing work of Jaime Lerner, um, uh, a Brazilian former mayor that I was fortunate to, um, to work with during the Rio Plus 20 uh, summit back in 2012. Um, and he said that his, his key role was to listen to the music of my city. Um, he writes about that process in his book, Urban Acupuncture. But, um, but it, it is quite a remarkable case, but he, because what he did was, was instead of closing the doors and spending time with his official developing and carving out a five-year plan, he said, I I'm not having that, th that old, old approach to strategy development and, 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 and goals for my city. I want to have a rolling strategy, and I want to carve out this strategy with all of, of the citizens. So he walked the streets of Curitiba and he sensed into new potential to risk. And he, he worked with citizens on, on creating a flourishing city. And within the span of eight years, he transformed Curitiba from being one of the poorest in, in Brazil to one of the richest. Um, again, another re remarkable case. So the 
key role for the regenerative leader is to sense and respond, is the ability to listen, is the ability of being the alchemist of transformation, is that ability of sensing the greater interconnected whole and understanding the, um, the interconnectedness and the nestedness of, of all living system and where the organization fits into the greater whole, but also how things affect each other constantly, that when um, an employee is burned out and stressed, that creates huge ripple effects far beyond what we can often imagine. Um, so it's that approach of detecting how can I how can I nourish health and how, how can I hold space for a greater level of health and vitality um, in my living system. The third component of, uh, of the regenerative leadership and business DNA is the qualities that we need to nurture within, to stand strongly and grounded for us to be able to be these alchemists of change and be these um, safe space holders, holding space for, for emergence. Um, it's that ability to listen, to slow down. It's that ability to heal the story of separation and start to bring in nature, start to balance the feminine and the masculine qualities and capacities, bridge together the, the left brain hemisphere, the right brain hemisphere, the inner, the outer, and constantly be these alchemists of, of transformation. Um, by allowing this reconciliation process, uh, tapping into indigenous wisdom and, and allowing us to start to align with life to a greater extent. Um, so these are some of the regenerative leadership capacities that we do need to nurture within ourselves to be able to, um, to cross this bridge and to hold space for this liminal space of, um, of transformation, of metamorphosis that can often be very unpleasant, but also incredibly exciting if we train ourselves to look for, for the cracks of light. Um, so what we also talked a bit about um, yesterday when John and I were um, having a session on regenerative leadership at his um, at his course was the fact that a lot of the trauma that we see in this world and a lot of this um, disease and frustration and a, a lot of these degenerative ripple effects are are rooted in uh, in dysregulated nervous systems. We are generations of incredibly traumatized people um, because we are grown we have grown up in a in a traumatized, broken culture in many ways. And and this is continuously creating ripple effects because we 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 haven't been taught how to regulate our nervous system and how to be grounded. And again, it comes back to this inner that is informing the outer. Um, and we can never be stewards of life. And we can never train our eyes to see the wonders of nature if we are not in coherence uh, within ourselves. Um, this is inspired by uh, the polyvagal theory of Steve Porks. And, um, and the neuroception of safety is the first level. That is where we feel grounded. This is the ideal space for where we need to co-create and bring in this, uh, this regenerative era. That is where we feel grounded and safe and empowered and creative. And um, unfortunately, a lot of us often go into a slightly more dysregulated nervous system um, and it can show up in different forms. It can show up in what Steve Fawkes refers to as the find level where we are looking for comfort and, and appraisal outside, where we become addicted to people liking our post on LinkedIn, or form where we are constantly people pleasing, um, trying to fit in, making people, other people like us and become obsessive about being liked, or flee where we become very anxious and avoid others and don't want to go into conflict by anyone with anyone, or a fight where we are incredibly easily triggered and very easily annoyed with other people. And we know all of these levels, um, I, I assume, 
most of you have experienced various degrees of these states. And it's important for regenerative leaders to be aware of, because, as I said, we can only bring in this new era if we are grounded and if we um, have the courage and the curiosity to start exploring living systems wisdom and dare to bring in a new kind of energy into our organizations, into our businesses, into the the structures and systems that we are a part of. It's that approach of recognizing that we are cyclical beings on a cyclical planet and, and we cannot force ourselves to be in constant performer mode. We, we have all been growing up in a, in a culture where we falsely believe we can be in constant spring and summer, constantly performing, executing, getting great ideas, putting to market, presenting, keynoting, all of that. If we don't allow ourselves a restorative, regenerative, revitalizing autumn and winter energy where we are integrating new wisdom, um, we, we will deplete ourselves and we will again create regenerative extractive ripples um, across our, our spheres of influence. So it is being this again the alchemists of potential, of transformation, holding space for opposite and allowing um, th this transmutation of, of energies. So this was a tour de force presentation of the regenerative business and leadership DNA. We don't have more time because we want time for reflections and discussions as well. But what I just wanted to leave you with is the fact that although we have created this framework, I'm not a big fan of framework to, frameworks, to be honest, because often they get adopted in a very rigid way. And this framework is only here to help you gain overview. And you can take a detailed assessment. You can find that um, in our book that will give you an overview going through detailed questions and give you an overview that you can use to assess where you are right now and what you could focus on to improve. But at the end of the day, it's about cultivating the capacity to be weavers and co-creators in this era and understanding the, that to become a regenerative leader is not a certification process. It's, um, it's not a checklist and, and off you go and you are now a regenerative leader. It's a process that uh, will, will last a lifetime. And it's about constantly cultivating new capacities and learning to weave your unique tapestry of life by tapping into a multitude of of sectors and field um, and the essence is that we all need to align with life i'm gonna stop myself there and hopefully we have time for um some sharings uh, one one word for laura very quickly her book one of her books at least is translated in portuguese as she may know uh, and it is being presented here on uh, Plantiers World Gathering at an exib exhibitor called Bambual Editors. So yes. uh, have that in mind. They are here with the book of Laura. Yes. If you pass... Do go visit the lovely people at Bambual. Bambual is amazing people, okay? Second thing, a small comment that is a curiosity, but very beautiful. We have been, you know, with the uh, both for you, John uh, Fullerton and you, we have been with kids yesterday, with Gunter Pauli and the kids. I was about to, I was getting very emotional, and several people too. And uh, I must say that some of the uh, school, an, uh, a progressive school from the north of Portugal could only arrive today. They entered before going to, to, to listen to, to a talk uh, or to uh, um, a program that we want also to launch with uh, with uh, uh, older students, uh, 14 and up, and that starts from uh, in Italy. Uh, I, I I have here uh, Scole, the school. Uh, some applause also to Scole, the school of Matuzini. They are. They were listening to you, and I think really that we need to start with the younger generations. Uh, uh, Skole is part of the Ashoka network, also to say, to tell you this. And Ashoka is a big partner of us. Uh, uh, we have here Alexandre, 
uh, and also a, a young change maker that was on, on, on main stage today, together with the kids that uh, have put 33 countries in courts. And they are still on fast track, you know. So it's, it's been education, younger generations is really a big, a big topic here. Uh, Laura, many, many thanks for, for your uh, intervention. It is so important. And John, and we know, uh, and I, I, I don't need to say that it is to John, but to you, that uh, the, with John, we have been uh, co-creating things since the pandemic starts, and it's been, you know, immensely interesting. We have a hub, also to, to, to say again to you, we, you, you in the room, we have a hub in the, in the north of Portugal, that is innovation in uh, re, uh, innovation, innovation in regeneration. Sorry, innovation in sustainability and regeneration. In sure up, my colleague of mine, that is vice president uh, of uh, um, Catolica Porto, the Catholic University, is here, and we are trying really to create a big momentum across, you know, transforming from transforming businesses. Uh, to transform uh, uh, people. Uh, and so all quadrants is like uh, business leaders, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, uh, university courses with system thinking, regeneration, and then the, 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 life, the last point, very important, literacy, education of kids and, and grown-ups. And, uh, and uh, so uh, all these corners, as, as in your pitch, all these corners intersect. They, 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 they have bridges, right? Uh, if we speak about a, a business leader, the, he needs to get the innovation, right? He needs to get innovation from the outside. Uh, and so things like this uh, to, to happen. I, I'm a newbie in this field, uh, and, and thanks for, for Antonio to uh, presenting me to this community. Um, I will start by quoting a piece of a friend of mine who wrote that we need to save leadership for the, from the leadership people. And I think maybe I found a place where leadership could start to be saved. Uh, I heard a lot of inter interesting things. For instance, uh, Laura talked about at the end of her presentation, and thank you, Laura, uh, about the combination of curiosity with courage. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, some psychoanalysts, some British psychoanalysts, are saying that uh, curiosity may be one of the three fundamental, fundamental drives of our human development. So, mm -hmm. and curiosity should be uh, defined as the willingness to find new explanations for the same experiences that we have. And I've been hearing a lot about this afternoon about changing ecosystems and to rethink systems and actual and current models. And mm -hmm. I deeply believe that the most difficult system to change is our own individual minds. Mm -hmm. And also because we uh, don't know uh, a lot about how our minds work both physiologically and psychologically. Um, but I, I th I've heard some things here today that really resonated with me. For instance, uh, Gunter Pauli said that this problem that we all face is an ethical problem. For me, with leaders, it's the same thing. Leaders should be more ethical. By the Aristotelian uh, definition of ethics, it's the um, respect for the own interests while respecting others' interests and the interests of the system. So combining those three dimensions is very difficult. The problem is with leadership and leaders that if you say to a leader to be more ethical, what's the answer? They already are, right? So it's a language that does not resonate with leaders because ethics and leadership don't mix like water and olive oil, but they should. They should be the basis of all leadership. I also um, heard at the start of the afternoon Antonio say that we should cause no harm. I deeply believe that our work lives are making us sick, like Laura said or suggested as well. 
And I think that the job of leaders should be to take care of their people, their teams, and their companies. And I th really think that um, I would, I think sometimes I think of myself as an activist, a psychological activist, to say that leaders should have like some, at, at least here in Portugal we have uh, time exemption. Some functions do not, are, limit, are not limited by time. And I defend that leaders should have operational work exemption. Leaders should not work. They should take care of their people, mm -hmm. period. That's the function of leaders. I think that we are miles away from this, but uh, regenerative leadership might be a way to get us closer to that reality. Um, I also heard the shift from uh, inspiration um, in machines towards inspiration by life and by living organisms. I, I deeply believe, and I think that the pandemic rose this question to the table, and Laura addressed this as well, that we are at the point of, um, of conflict between two definitions of growth. Economic growth or mathematical growth does not, is not the same thing as organic growth. Think of a person. A person, when growing up, will, when evolving, it start, a person starts to decline, at, at least in, in his or her physical aspect. Economic growth does not contemplate decline. It's always climbing. The objective is to scale, right? We humans, human life does not scale. It ends. At least some of us, when we grow up, we become more uh, wise, ethical, some of us, not all of us. I think that what we should scale is this new old definition of growth and apply it to this new reality. We need to shift businesses into a more organic paradigm. And this is, well, I, I've seen wonderful paths that could make this uh, idea possible. So, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Ron. Laura, just to know you are on the big screen and nodding a lot. I think you have, you want to add something. <laughs> I can I can only say that I resonate with um, whoever just uh, shared reflections there, um, and I think the same goes for John. Right? That yes, it's about tapping into curiosity. It's about tapping into courage. Um, what I see to a greater and greater extent is um, an increased level of courage among many business executives. Um, a lot of things are happening these days um, behind closed doors still because out of fear of being ridiculed, but there's a lot of really interesting things happening among many corporations right now. They're getting their heads around this. They understand that they can't continue this extractive, exploitative approach to to leadership and organizational design and how to run an organization. Um, I'm not saying it's it's going to be easy, but what I'm saying is that, that I see a lot of these cracks of light. I see a lot of potential. I see a lot of change. I see a lot of um, a growing number of people that are coming back home and coming back to their true essence. Um, and when we have surrender to our true essence, um, that is when we start to be in, in, in a state of coherence. When we are in a state of coherence, we start to align with life. Um, and that is the state from which we can bring about new ways of being. And I also agree with what was shared that, um, that leadership in the regenerative era is, is it's not just for executives, and we will start to question executives um, in, and, and their role. And the case that I mentioned of Portsog is a brilliant case of all 15,000 employees seeing themselves as their own leaders, part of the same collective. 
um, but they're each tapping in and have a great uh, high degree of freedom and where the, the, the chief executive officer sees himself as an ecosystem nurturer that listens to the system. And, and we see more and more organizations where executives are starting to, um, I hate to use the word wake up, but are starting to come back to center, uh, coming back to their essence and, and, and realizing with courage, because it takes so much courage to admit to yourself that what you just spent 30 years of your life on, walking that corporate ladder, and now you, you start to look around you from up there and you see kind of landscapes of destruction, literally. And you start to realize um, that we are in the midst, midst of a six mass extinction. You start to realize your own role in that. And although there is immense sadness and grief in, in, in surrendering to that acceptance, there is, there is also breakthrough happening in the midst of that breakdown that I'm fortunate to witness um, first, firsthand more or less every day. Um, executives that are coming to people like John and I um, because they are committed to, to, to honor their, their, their last years where they um, where they are working as executives of bringing about a new era and holding space for that emergence that i was talking about um and and dedicating um the years that they have left to um, to help new leaders that are that are realizing this and have this really? part of of their programming help them and uh, empowering them so there's a lot of interesting things happening in the leadership um, space these days, and I think you see the same, right, John? Yeah, the, the, I mean, there's not much I can add to Laura on this topic, um, and, and I, I would just um, point out two things, maybe. One, that uh, Laura embodies a feminine leadership, which is what's been missing. We've been trapped in this competitive uh, reductionist, um, dog eat dog, you know, uh, capitalist system, which favors all of the, you know, let's call them masculine energy attributes and putting women on the board of directors so we can check the box is not the answer. The answer is, is embracing our feminine intuition and, um, and celebrating a much more balanced understanding of of leadership it's not that masculine is bad and feminine is good it's again getting back to first principles there's a harmonic balance that actually describes how life works so if we can use living systems principles as our compass it will become obvious that we have a business world dominated by masculine competitive ruthless um, uh, hero quote unquote heroes and those leaders are, are ill-adapted to the new context. Um, the other thing I would say is just, again, on context, um, and, and, and I apologize I didn't hear the name of the person who introduced himself just before and said he was a newbie to the space, but then went on to articulate pretty much uh, everything I would love to hear and yeah. resonated very it's strongly. Wrong. Um, His name is Juan. Rob? It's Juan. <laughs> Rob, thank you. Okay. Um, but just one one point on context. This is not um, the next gimmick in management, you know, business management consulting speak. We, we live at a moment, um, and and I, I I hadn't noticed, but Laura also uses this idea of regenerative era um, uh, as a new era in humanity. Um, you know, we've heard about the Anthropocene. Increasingly, I think a way to understand this is that we've been living as humanity as if we're a chick inside an egg, where there's unlimited protein to chew away at and chew away at and waste, and that's a very unsustainable way to live. We've now reached the shell, and we're breaking through the shell, and we literally need to learn an entire new way of living on this planet, just the way a chick needs to learn how to fly and how to take care of him or herself outside the shell where there's not unlimited resources. And that's, that's 
that's the most profound shift in the history of humanity. That's not, that's not a new, you know, that's, that's not like going from the agricultural age to the industrial age. This is a much more profound shift than that. And that's why it feels so unsettling. And that's why it is so unsettling. But that's our opportunity is to seize this opportunity and figure out how to do this. And honestly, listening to Laura uh, describe this, I, I, you know, I can't, I can't think of a better uh, way to, to begin to process this and internalize it uh, than, than listening to Laura talk about it. Thank you. Thank you, John. Juan, want to add something? No, not really. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, John. It was a, a pleasure to have you both. I, I can check from here, uh, John, there is sunshine in Connecticut. Then you can take a little sunshine now. Thank you very much okay. for your kindness and to be with us and all, all the thoughts that you have lived with us. And our session has just uh, finished. Thank you very much.